Hi, I'm Zach, and your science teacher asked me to talk to you today about my experience studying wolves in the field. I'm really excited to talk with you because I think wolves are fascinating animals, and I hear you recently learned about wolf biology and the role they play in the food chain. So I'm here to talk to you about how we actually study wolves in the field. I spent six months as a wolf biologist in Yellowstone National Park with the Yellowstone Wolf Project, and the project was established in 1995 when wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone. This picture shows wolves being brought back into Yellowstone in this truck, which was a really exciting moment. As European settlers moved west in the 1800s, they systematically wiped out most of the predators, like wolves, cougars, and bears, because they were worried that the carnivores actually posed a threat to them and their livestock. And then... In the 1980s, cougars and bears actually started returning on their own. And then, in 1995, wolves were reintroduced, which again is shown in this picture. And for the first time in almost 100 years, Yellowstone once again had all of its native animals that were there before European settlers arrived. This made Yellowstone unique in North America, which made it an especially exciting place to study all sorts of wildlife. So why do we do this research? Well, first of all, wolves are fascinating animals and it's really cool to be able to study them. Second, Yellowstone has been a really valuable place to study how predators and prey interact with each other because as I mentioned, it has a complete set of all of its native animals, which many places in North America and the whole world no longer do. And that's allowed us to learn a lot about their basic ecology and behavior. And this has helped us inform other wolf reintroduction efforts throughout the world. We have all sorts of research questions we can ask. We can ask how many animals are there? So how many wolves, how many elk are there? And we can ask what they eat and how they interact with each other. But to answer those questions, we first need data. And that's where field work comes in. In order to collect the data, there need to be people like me who go out all day, every day, all over the park, collecting data that help researchers answer those questions. So now I'm gonna talk about the different field methods that we use. One of the main methods that we use are trail cameras. These are mostly used for estimating population sizes. Trail cameras are remote motion sensor cameras that you put up on a tree and then you leave them for several months and each time an animal walks past, it triggers the motion sensor and it takes a picture. And we can look at these pictures and see how often certain animals are showing up. And in this case, we're looking at wolves. We have computer models where we input those data on how many pictures of wolves we have and how often the same individuals are showing back up and those models tell us how many wolves there are in the whole area. And then these next two videos are from trail cameras that actually took videos instead of pictures. One of the really fun things about using trail cameras is that we get pictures of more than just the species we're studying. So we put up cameras to monitor wolves, but we get pictures of anything that passes in front of the camera. And then that means that we have data on all these other animals. So here's a black bear and here's a puma. And then we can use the pictures of those other species ourselves, or we can give them to other researchers who are more interested in those species. And trail cameras are really widely used in a lot of studies all over the world to study a bunch of different animals, not just wolves. Next up is scat. 
So scat is really just the scientific word for poop. And scat is another really common tool for studying wildlife because you can learn a lot just from looking at the scat. So you can see which animal made it, so which species. You can dissect it to look for bones and hair to tell us the animal's diet. Or you can collect genetic samples from it, which is what we actually used it for. There are skin cells from the inside of the wolf's digestive tract that end up on the outside of the scat, and we can take samples of those and then use them to identify the individual that made it, which is another way that we can tell the population size by using more computer models, similar to the ones that we use for trail cameras. We can also determine which individuals in the population are breeding and how different packs are related to each other because animals will leave one pack and go join another or form a new pack and start breeding. With those two methods, we don't need to know exactly where the animals are. We need to know generally where their habitat is, but we can just put out trail cameras and wait for them to walk by or walk down trails that we think they've been on and look for scat that they've left behind. Next, I'm going to talk about some methods that we can actually use to find the wolves. The first one is a howl survey, and these are really cool. We go out and howl just like a wolf, and believe it or not, the wolves actually think we're another wolf and they howl back at us. Then we can follow the howls to document where they are, or if we know where the wolves were hanging out from howling at them, then we can collect a lot more scat samples, and everybody loves more scat. So here I have a video of me howling. And then this next video is wolves actually howling back at us because they thought we were wolves. That was a way that we can use to find the wolves without ever really being in contact with them. So they know that we're there, but they think we're just other wolves. They're not bothered by humans. So this next method, they really do know we're there because we're actually putting collars on them. Now, you might be wondering, how do we collar a wolf? You can see in this picture here that wolves are really big animals. They often weigh over a hundred pounds and as you can see in this picture of my boss Doug collaring a wolf it's almost as big as he is so how do you get a collar on them so we need to put them to sleep either by trapping them in a live trap and then sedating them or we can dart them from a helicopter then we can put the collar on them collect data about them like how much they weigh things like that and then the wolf wakes back up and then it goes back into the wild and we can start collecting data from the collars. Biologists use two different types of collars. First are radio collars. Those we use to find the wolves right now. We locate the wolf using what's called radio telemetry. The collars send out a radio signal with each collar set to a specific frequency. So to find a specific wolf, we tune into its frequency and we pick up the signal with an antenna like my coworker Annie is doing in this picture. The telemetry receiver turns that signal into beeps, which get louder when we're closer to the collar and thus closer to the wolf or when we're pointed directly at it. And we can use those through a lot of trial and error to eventually figure out where the wolves are. So we found the wolves. Now what do we do? We watch them. We have these really high-powered telescopes called spotting scopes that lets us watch them from up to several miles away. While we're watching them, we can observe their behavior and record interesting behaviors like hunting or feeding or playing with each other or interacting with other packs and other animals. Here's a video of pups and an adult from the 8 Mile Pack in Yellowstone playing with each other. The pups are about four months old in the video. They are born sometime in April, and then this video was taken in August. 
and we took this through a spotting scope. So we're about two miles away from the wolves right now, but we can still see them really well through the scope. And the pups are playing with the pack's breeding female, who's their mother, who leads the pack along with the breeding male. And you can just see that she's wearing a collar, which is how we actually found them in order to observe them. We've talked about radio collars, which tell us where the wolves are right now, right in that moment. And the other type of collars that we use are GPS collars, which tell us where they were in the past. And in reality, most collars have a radio unit and a GPS unit, so they can be used for both. So the GPS collar figures out where it is, just like the GPS in your cell phone when it tells you where you are, and it sends that location to a satellite, and then we can download it to a computer. And we look for clusters of GPS points, which are when the wolf was hanging out in one spot for a long time, because that usually means that they're either eating or sleeping, and we're really interested in when they're eating. This is a map of GPS clusters. This is actually one that we used in the field in Yellowstone. And so we would make these maps every day. And those points, so 60, 47, 59, 56, those are all the GPS point clusters, which we think might be a kill. But we need to know for sure, so we hike out to them. And then once we get there, we need to determine if it's a kill site. And sometimes it's really obvious. If you've ever seen dogs eating, they're really messy and they get food all over the place. And wolves are the exact same way because wolves and dogs are very closely related. And at a lot of kill sites, we would find blood and hair and limbs just strewn out about all over the place because it's not just one wolf. It's the entire pack, which means that there can be up to 15 wolves all sitting there eating together. And other times, it's not as obvious. So, an adult elk or bison's bones are really thick and hard to chew through, and they also have horns or antlers that the wolves don't want to eat. So, when you get to a place where they killed an adult, then you have all this stuff left behind, and it's really easy to find. But a young calf or fawn's bones are soft and thin, and the wolves can just crunch them right up and eat them. And at a lot of places where they've killed a calf, everything we can find, we can hold in one hand, just like at this kill here. So it really requires some detective work sometimes to actually find the kill. So what do we do once we know it's a kill? We see what it was the wolves were eating. So first we identify the species. So here we have an elk on the left and a bison on the right. And sometimes wolves actually eat other carnivores. So on the left, we have a coyote, and on the right, it's a bear. So we think the wolves didn't actually kill the bear because sometimes they just find an animal dead on the ground and start eat eating it, which is called scavenging. And if there's a lot of fresh blood on the ground, that means that the animal was bleeding as the wolves were killing it. But if there isn't, then the animal probably just died and the wolves found it. So that's how we tell if they actually killed it or if they were just scavenging it, which again is where it just died and then the wolves started eating. So Next, we determine if it was a male or a female. And then we figure out roughly how old it is based on how worn down their teeth are. And then we also take an actual tooth sample. So we pull out a whole tooth because teeth grow rings each year, just like trees. So we take it back and then somebody else in another lab takes a really thin slice of that tooth and then they actually count how many rings there are and they can tell us how old the animal is. And then finally, we take a bone marrow sample by cutting open its leg bone or its femur. So bone marrow is what's on the inside of the bone and we can tell how healthy the animal was when it died based on how much fat is in the bone marrow. So if it's full of fat, then the animal was in really good condition. But if there's not much fat, then that tells us that the animal wasn't doing very well before the wolves ate it. Obviously it wasn't doing well after they ate it. Because if they're starving, then they're having to rely on that store of fat inside their body for energy rather than just what they're eating. 
other thing that we do at the kill site, once we're done dissecting it, is we figure out who else was there eating the carcass. So when wolves kill something, it provides food for a whole lot of other animals. Bears and coyotes and ravens and eagles, other wolf packs, and even for the insects and the bacteria and microbes that live in the soil. So we look for scat or tracks from other animals to see who else was using the carcass. All that information that we're getting out of examining these kill sites is extremely valuable because understanding who the wolves are eating, so what species, is it female or male, old or young, starving or healthy, how many of their hunts are successful, so how often they are actually killing things, as well as what food they're making available for other animals. That all changes throughout the year, and we can really start to figure out how wolf populations interact with the prey populations and with other predators. And since this project has been doing the same research for 25 years now, we've really gotten a good idea of how these interactions have changed over time. I hope all that information was helpful. So these methods are used all over the world to study a lot of different types of animals, and they're just a few of the methods that exist to study wildlife. I wanted to finish up by talking about why we actually do this work. So first of all, as I said, it's really fun. It's amazing to see these animals up close and to learn about them by actually seeing them and seeing what they're eating and what, how they're interacting with the environment. And second of all, learning about them is really crucial to their survival. So we can learn about how human activities like hunting or logging or building roads might affect these wild populations. And then we can work to prevent those things from actually harming them and work on coexistence between humans and wildlife. I've really enjoyed talking with you about how we study wolves, and I hope you enjoyed learning about it. If any of you have any questions, or you, maybe you want to find out how to actually get involved in work like this yourself, your teacher has all my information. I would love to hear from any of you. So thank you so much for having me in your class today. And who knows, maybe I'll see some of you out there in the field someday.